Yes. Hello, welcome to this week's episode of Presence. This week, we are joined by artist Nancy Yodelman. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. It is fabulous to have you on because you are someone with an incredible oeuvre of artistry and and life experience. So I'm really excited to see where it's going to take us today. Let me introduce you to our listeners and viewers who may or may not be familiar with you. I'm going to read a couple of snippets from your bio. Nancy has been exhibiting since 1971. And this is what I think is really quite fascinating. Nancy was part of the first feminist art class and project taught by Judy Chicago. She was also part of the first feminist art program between 1971 and 1973. She's been a part of multiple projects such as Woman House. She has a BFA from Cal Arts and MFA from UCLA. She's been an artistic consultant with the 19th said Rolling Stones concert in the U.S. In addition to many of your accomplishments and projects that you worked in, it's also notable that Nancy's part of many prestigious collections. Her works have been collected by private collectors, as well as museums, such as the Brooklyn Museum, the San Francisco Museum, the Modern Museum of Art in Los Angeles and in New York City. So there's a lot to Nancy, but I think it would be more fun if Nancy tells us more about herself. Can you fill in some of the gaps for us, Nancy? Well, I'd like to go way back go way back to when I was in high school, because that was in the 60s. I graduated from high school in 1966. But before that, I knew that I wanted to do something important, but I never knew what it was. I used to think I wanted to be a writer, like write fiction, Mm -hmm. write books, because I love to read. I was always reading from, in fact, from the time I learned to read that was important to me, but I never wrote. So to be a writer, you have to write. (laughs) I kept diaries and I also did artwork. I love to draw, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I remember in high school, this was, it was so embarrassing. It was a high school English class and it was kind of an advanced English class. The teacher, we were all working on a project and the teacher singled me out and had me go up to his desk and he motioned for me to lean down and he whispered in my ear he said you're a lot of woman and I remember just being totally shocked that's when we had to wear dresses to school we couldn't wear pants that was unheard of you know like now the whole me too movement well back then I was so embarrassed I it just made my face turn bright red. I just turned around. I went back to my seat. And he's also the same English teacher that in front of the whole class, he said, Nancy is too pretty to be smart. Goodness. Very awkward. That was at Fresno High. And then I went to Fresno State. I was a new student in 1966. And I still didn't know what I wanted to do. I took poetry writing, creative writing. I took costume and make up for the theater, which I loved. And then I started taking art classes. But back then, and it was true that if there was a class, men and women, you know, that when there was a discussion, the men would really like be vital to it. They'd be talking and the women would just recede back. I used to go to some political meetings because it was back then, you know, the end the war in Vietnam. And it was a huge movement at Fresno State um, protesting the war. The women would make coffee. I'm not mm-hmm. kidding. And it was the men the, the you would look up to these men. And I was raised by a, a strong woman, my mother, mm-hmm was widowed and raised four children. She worked as a nurse. It was very unusual to have a single parent back then. But so I was in this, in this kind of Netherland or this Mm -hmm. not knowing 
I knew I wanted to do something important. I didn't know what it was or even how to do it. And one day in 1970, in the spring, I was in the art building at Fresno State, and I saw this little note. Well, it's actually like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper taped up on the wall that said, women interested in an all women sculpture class sign up here. And so I signed my name and then I heard that we would be interviewed. It was a teacher named Judy Garowitz from Los Angeles. On the day I was supposed to be interviewed, someone had called in a bomb threat. So the school was shut down. That's what the the protesters, the anti-war protesters would often call in. They were phony bomb mm-hmm. threats. But, you know, no one knew if it was really truly phony or not. So my interview got postponed. But then finally, I did speak with Judy. And I, I'll never forget our first meeting because she really struck me as here's a person who knows herself. She had complete command of herself. She said to me, do you want to be a professional artist? And I said, I already am an artist. And she looked at me and she said, (laughs) no, you're not. (laughs) Because, and thinking back, I had no idea what professional artist meant. Mm -hmm. I carried a sketchbook around. I was always drawing in it. I would draw everything I saw. And I thought that meant you're an artist. After that, when working with her, I really learned what it means (laughs) to be an artist. So anyway, I was chosen for the class. There were 15 women. It was a year long class. Thinking back now, I don't think it could happen now because you can't really limit classes by gender. We met off campus. She insisted we rent this huge space we found. It was 5,000 square feet. It was so cheap. We paid maybe $20 a month each and had this gigantic space. She taught us how to build a wall. We built a 40-foot wall within that space. I'll never forget carrying sheetrock, big four by eight feet sheets of heavy sheetrock, how to carry it without hurting ourselves. She insisted we buy work boots. The best thing, she really encouraged us to look kind of deep inside ourselves for imagery because we were like, you know, it's an art class what we wanted to do. And I decided I wanted to use that costume and makeup that I'd learned in the theater department. So I had collected all these costumes in the back of that 40 foot wall. I made a whole little costume shop and I had, you know, clothing hanging and I had grease paint. I had a whole wicker suitcase. And then, so I dress up the other students and we do oh I dress one as a cupid doll and myself as like a Las Vegas hooker <laughs> and <laughs> wow and then one of the women Dory Atlantis is her name she um is a photographer she built a dark room in that space she did a lot of the pho- photography really excellent and Judy encouraged she would just look at the work. She'd say, oh, you need to like push it further, this, that. And she was excellent with that. Very encouraging. And then in the middle of the class, she changed her name legally to Judy Chicago. She put a whole ad, I think it was in Art Forum magazine, about I hereby divest all male influence and pick a name of my own choosing, which she was from Chicago. So... That's really why one of the reasons she chose it. But it was amazing. When you talk about an experience that's life-changing, that really was. And it was a year-long course. Also, somewhere in the middle of it, she found out she could be teaching at CalArts, California Institute of the Arts down south. And she invited Miriam Shapiro, an artist who was going to be teaching at CalArts, up to our studio in Fresno and Miriam had me costume her as a Victorian lady. There's a really wonderful photograph of that. And they, Judy and and Mimi, Miriam wanted us to call her Mimi. They made the plans for this whole feminist art program that was official at CalArts. About half of us in that first class applied to CalArts and got accepted and moved down south. I never would have done any of that, I don't think, on my own. So it was 
It was pretty amazing. Wow. She was quite a catalyst yes. for you. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. You can Google search Nancy Yodelman or Judy Chicago and a couple of snippets will come out, but it won't give you this backstory of your teacher making inappropriate comments that were awkward <laughs> and just oh, really that uncalled was, for. Yeah. We wouldn't normally know that if we're not in a platform like this where you share that. And, and I can see how that could either make you go inward and feel small or it could make you say, no, I'm not going to put up with this or a combination of both. I tended to want to hide it. It was to me, it was so embarrassing. It was so uncalled for. Mm. And yet, once we start to verbalize things, there's a certain freedom and healing that comes with it. This morning, I, I, I was sitting, having a cup of coffee, staring at the trees outside of my patio. And I was just thinking about things that are left unsaid. And sometimes those things that are left unsaid, they are unsaid because we have sometimes a sense of loyalty towards someone and we think, oh, this person or this institution is going to be hurt if I speak up. So then sometimes what ends up happening is we make ourselves small. We stay quiet. We don't say this person said this, this happened to me because we have this sense of someone might get hurt. I may be perceived a certain way. And yet when we speak up, we set ourselves free, we heal, but we could potentially be helping somebody. And I know that that's something I've struggled with where, oh, should I speak up and say that a certain thing happened to me? Even though, you know, here we are, what is this? 50 years later, yes, <laughs> you know, yeah. some of us still have that, oh, I don't know if I should speak up, especially women. I'm not saying that men do not have this, this challenge, because that would be erroneous. Men do too. But oftentimes you see women not always wanting to speak up because, you know, we're worried about how we'll be perceived, but we also carry this, this guilt, this internalized guilt, because sometimes we feel that, oh, we deserved it, or, you know, we called attention to ourselves and, and so forth. I think it's been ingrained in women through the culture, even today, mm -hmm. of how you a woman or gir young girl should behave, be mm -hmm. nice, keep your knees together, don't call attention to yourself i mean although i think it of course it, it has changed Thankfully. it 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 has it absolutely has changed a lot and yet has it changed in the way that is the best for society has it gone askewed you know sometimes you wonder these things because there has been a backlash Right. In the in the oh, last in the last decade or so, we've seen a big backlash in terms of understanding what feminism is and what women have fought for. Some people say, I'm not a feminist, I don't believe in that. And I think that maybe the definitions are are a little blurred. Maybe people don't really understand what feminism means. I think that where people misunderstand things is that the original feminist never necessarily said, I am the same as a man, because by default, let's say physically, a male is stronger than a woman, just biologically, if you just go by biology, I'm not talking about gender preferences and so forth. I'm just saying biologically. The hormonal thing makes yes. muscles and... Right. I believe what the original feminists were, weren't necessarily saying we can both lift a hundred pounds. No, they're saying we both have the same quality of mind. We are smart. We are deserving. Yes. 
Because I know for me, what feminism means is treating everyone with the dignity that they deserve, that we have, and that kind of equal um, sharing. For me, that's true feminism. When I used to teach, I'd want each student to be able to speak and talk. And, you know, that was one of Judy's techniques, going around the room with everyone given the time the voice to speak what they wanted or needed to say and that whole thing of dignity is so important it's feminist the word feminist is so misunderstood it is and I also I I like that you said dignity but I also like that you said voice voice giving everybody a voice so you know in this backlash that we're seeing sometimes people forget that women could not have a credit card up until I want to say the 80s yeah Um, in the 70s you a woman couldn't get a credit card unless a man or a husband signed there's certain things that we take for granted and I think there's been a lot of progress and I think it's something to be celebrated and that progress wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for women of your generation paving the way for my generation and the future generations. So I think that there's so many things that we take for granted and we have to say thank you. Yeah. Thank you for holding the torch and for all of the privileges that I enjoy. Thank you for all of the privileges that other women enjoy. We enjoy these privileges because you know, you were the brave ones. And I do think it's important to say that. And I understand that everybody has a right to different belief systems. But I encourage people to do their research and understand what feminism is and what it is not. It is not women saying that they're better than men. It's women saying, give us the same opportunities in terms of using our mind in terms of being given a voice being treated with dignity right earning the same amount of money equal pay yes that's a big still an it's still an issue right i think the the country and the world that has the the closest pay gap is iceland I believe yes i believe it was in 1975 in iceland women said we will not do any work today no cooking no cleaning yeah nothing 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 the country came to a complete stop when women just stopped working whether they were in the house or in the workplace there's still a pay gap difference but it's the best in the world i encourage people to do their research and to be weary of misinformation that you sometimes hear in social media where it seems as if women think that they're better than men no absolutely not we are both wonderful however it is that you identify male female whatever we're all wonderful we all have our own different uniqueness but what we're saying is give us the dignity that we deserve that everybody deserves yes right Right. I agree. It's, 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 it's basically back to basics. And and of course, the conversation can go in many directions. That's something that we could leave for another day, because I'd love for you to tell us a bit about your work, your work as an artist. You shared with us something so personal and, and you were so vulnerable. And I want to thank you for sharing with us about that experience you had Uh, with that teacher and how that impacted you and then continuing to share how impactful it was to meet Judy and then go to school at both Fresno State and Cal Arts. Even though you're part of the movement, you're you. You're Nancy Nancy Yodelman who has her own identity, right? Her own specific style of work. And it would be lovely for you to tell us about the direction your work took 
I'll talk about a piece I did in 1973. And the reason why it's important to me now is because it's been acquired by the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. And it's mm -hmm. currently on display. I was down there last week and saw it and met with the curator. So it's on display and it's part of a large exhibit that's called Mapping the Art World, Los Angeles, 1970 to 1980. And so this artwork, and a lot of times I get the idea just comes into my head. Usually when I'm not thinking about much of anything. Sometimes I dream. I'll talk uh, about other series of work that came to me in a dream. This, I had this burning desire to collect all the leaves in my neighborhood. There were big trees. I forget what kind of trees. This was in the San Fernando Valley. So I raked up all the leaves I wanted to do a series of photos of my body gradually covered into a big pile of leaves. So I had this idea, collecting all the leaves in the neighborhood, and then I set up a tripod, a camera mm -hmm. on a tripod, and I did all the settings, because back then it was not digital, it was film. You had to get the right settings or it, you know, it just would be too light or too dark. So you had to get it just right. I had all the leaves and I had my roommate throw leaves on my body. I was laying there. I didn't have clothes on, but I wrapped myself with a bunch of cheesecloth that I had dyed this kind of pale pink. So there was that on my body. Of course, I was in my early to mid twenties. Anyway, it looked if you know what the pre-Raphaelite painters mm -hmm. yes. kind of work, it had that feeling. So it was a series of six photos, first starting out me just laying on the leaves covered with that cheesecloth and then gradually till I was completely covered. And I called it Leaves, a Self-Portrait. Mm. And it's amazing to me that that work is of interest now you know, and I'm excited about that because at the time I was so driven to do it. I didn't question what does it mean or what is it, you know, it just, it was like this burning desire to do it. Also, a little bit later in the 70s, I had a dream that I was gluing broken glass to lace. It was a lace I think a lace blouse or lace dress. And I was gluing these little pieces of broken glass. And in, in the dream, it was perfect. At the time, also, I was reading Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. There's the character, Miss Havisham. She was a woman who was jilted at the altar as a young woman. The groom didn't show up. She kept her wedding dress on. And it was in the book, the time period of the book, she was an old woman with this rotting wedding dress. And to me, that image was just incredible. And so I was reading that. And somehow, I think that worked into my dream, the old, it was old rotting lace with broken glass. So I did a whole series of work I called shattered glass that was like antique lace blouses. I worked on my floor. I had an attic studio by then right in Los Angeles. I would paint it with glue and get a big sheet of glass, put it over it. I put clear plastic over it and then I'd smash it with a hammer. And it would take a very long time for the glue to dry. And then I'd cut out a backing in clear acrylic plastic to make it stronger. And I still have some of those and they've really held up. It's surprising how wow. well they hold up. You wouldn't think, I mean, but I love that work because I never questioned why am I doing it? Why would I work with broken glass? Why would I? Do oh, and recently a friend of mine reminded me that he had come to visit me during that time. And I said, oh, if you go in my studio, watch out for all the broken glass. And he thought, what the heck? <laughs> but my work comes from a, I believe, a very special place. And yes. it seems to resonate with people because people respond to it. I also have 
done like a friend of mine gave me his mother's wedding shoes that were she was married in the 1930s but I put the shoes together and I got silk thread and I bound all around bound them together so it looks like shoes but yet they're kind of distorted and I also mm. added jewelry and other stuff I was writing some notes Nancy as I heard you speak because you share so much and I didn't want to forget and I I wanted to touch upon something very interesting earlier you said you were a little surprised that now the work that you did back then people are finding it relevant but yet it's not surprising because it is distance that gives us the the aha it is sometimes distance that helps us to recognize the spirit of the times the zeitgeist so you know it is with the distance of time that we're able to look back to the 60s, the 70s and 80s and say, this is what was happening. And these were the people creating art that reflected that spirit of the times. Additionally, you know you were talking about reading Great Expectations and, you know, this woman and her rotting wedding dress And it just makes me think of, you know, the trope and the archetype of the woman that loses her mind because, you know, she was left at the altar, right? The lace dress. This is a trope that gets recycled. And something that's quite interesting about your work is that you take touchstones that represent some type of femininity, whether it's a blouse or a dress, right? Something that symbolizes, it's some type of allegory that symbolizes womanhood, but you turn it upside down, whether it is by binding the shoes or with the broken glass. It makes me think how you were really looking at tropes, whether, you know, you can tell me, Cindy, I did it consciously or subconsciously. I don't know, only you could answer the question, but it seems to me like, you were connecting, tuning in to those tropes of the XYZ woman or a certain representation of woman and giving it your own twist, your own outlook and making us think about, oh, why do I perceive shoes in this way or blouses in this way? Why the broken glass? I don't usually ask why. But see, that's what distance does. The distance leads us to the why. And then we can say, oh, yes, but X, Y, Z was going on. Yeah. Completely unrelated to you, completely unrelated in, in, in style and so forth. But for example, Edward King Holtz, right? He oh, would, I loved his work. Yes. Yeah. He would, he would take see. certain pieces similar to how you you know might take a shoe or a dress or a blouse he would take pieces that represented something about society and he would make something out of it but you know his tended to go a little bit darker (laughs) than than, than yours did a very pointed social commentary yes And, and yours is social commentary too but again from this perspective of womanhood and what is womanhood you're defining it for us and it's with this distance that we're questioning and we're creating an entire narrative around it but we couldn't have those narratives if it wasn't done back then and if it wasn't being influenced by all those tropes interesting make a very good point too so I think it's quite fabulous and I wanted to interject how we can look at some of the the different threads right yes and and look at it but again your work is diverse there's even more to you oh there's there's a lot yes (laughs) there's a lot a lot it's hard to know what to even talk about let me ask you a question Based on what first inspired you 
almost 50 years ago to what inspires you now, what is still similar and what has changed? Oh, well, what's similar is my love of old vintage stuff. Like lately in the past year or so, I've been collecting women's gloves, like Mm. cloth cloth and leather gloves from probably the 50s and earlier. But what I do with them is I stuff them. I like the small size because my hands are huge, but I love mine too. (laughs) <laughs> but I think that's good. You can do a lot if you've got big hands. Uh, but these gloves, what I do is uh, it's a contrast. I stuff them with cotton and then I get s- straight pins, you know, shiny silver or chrome straight pins. And I feed them through one at a time, like all the fingers, all the the hand part, the thumb until the whole glove is covered. You know, I have one here. And if someone's listening just to the audio, they wouldn't see it. But I love doing these. And I think what's the same is the love of the materials. But maybe what's different is it's I find it very meditative. Mm. It's almost like doing embroidery or crochet putting the pins in one at a time. And as I go, I can shape the glove. If someone, if someone's watching the video, they can see how there's an arch kind of on the back. And, but my work actually, it's mostly to me in my mind, the same as it always has been, because I get inspired by the materials. I try to keep things on my table one of my tables is back there and I can just pick something up and get an idea and start working. That's how I work. I've Mm -hmm. always kind of been that way, but then I can also seek out things. Like recently I did a piece I call sewing chair. It's an old small rocker, a wood rocker. Mm -hmm. It belonged to my ex-husband's grandmother. Wow. And, And anyway, but what I did is I collected first, I had sewing stuff. I, my mother's sewing basket, my mother-in-law's sewing things, my great aunt sewing things. And someone gave me a whole collection of buttons that belonged to their mother-in-law's aunt. You know, I mean, the list goes on and on. And then I decided I wanted a lot of those red tomato pin cushions which I love eBay because you can just type something in and then I just started buying them and they were not expensive and very plentiful. Mm -hmm. So I must have over a hundred of those pin cushions. And I love the fact that someone else used those pin cushions, someone else, you know, it's got their collection of pins and then they somehow ended up on eBay. Maybe they died or I don't know. I don't know how there's a history to them. Yes. It's the history I respond to. So, and I also work with pearl necklaces, old pearl necklaces that they're fake um, pearls, but I love the fact that somebody wore those at one time. Mm -hmm. What I did with the pearl necklaces was got a lot of vintage kitchen utensils that then I wrapped the pearl necklaces using waxed cord. And then I also use encaustic, which it's beeswax with melted with Damar resin. And it, when it cools, it makes the most beautiful surface. It does. It's slick, lush, and shiny. Yes, yes. And it also has, retains a scent. Mm -hmm. It's partly the beeswax, partly the Damar resin that I love that smell. So, and they say encaustic, you know, can last a couple of thousand years. I mean, the Egyptians used it. The Toward the end of the Egyptian dynasties. No. They were doing encaustic painting and the colors are still vivid. And anyway, so materials are very important to me. Yeah. Once someone told me about a place where I could buy a bunch of broken buttons and I thought, okay, that does not appeal to me. Partly because I love buttons like from someone's button collection because women used to 
save buttons. And they're obviously buttons that had been used because that's what women used to do. You'd cut all the, like you had an old shirt that got ruined or old, you'd cut all the buttons off then you'd use the shirt for rags. <laughs> so it all got used for something. But I like if they're just broken buttons and volume, it didn't appeal to me at all. So I like it. Once again, it is the history Right. I'm wearing a little brooch and this brooch belonged to my mother. And so I like some old world things. Like I do like pearls and I do like brooches. So sometimes I'll wear pearls and sometimes I'll wear a brooch that's rather old. Like this one, there's something about it having some type of history to it right? That gives it a, a an aura, an aura that something freshly mint, new and shiny doesn't have. And that's not to say something mint and, sh- and shiny doesn't have value. It does. But there's something about an aura around something that has history, especially if you have a connection to it. And I think that's something that a lot of your artwork has, Nancy this connection to something, someone, a history, an idea through these touchstones of things that represent different aspects of what it has meant to be a woman from the button that was saved in case you needed it for another shirt, right? The lace, you know, the, the pearls in case you had to get dressed up for some type of event that was passed down from mother to daughter or you know granddaughter and so forth and there's something about an inherent value in things that connect us with our past there's a certain sentimentality about it yes right and and that brings us back to who we are as human and within that humanity You do have femininity, you have masculinity, you have blurred lines, you have everything in between, but it's through that sentimentality that those memories are made and those connections are valued. And you say, oh, oh, that reminds me of grandma X. It reminds me of this. It reminds me of that. And I think that that's what creates a sense of connection, a, a, a sense of recognition if you will, that distance, we were talking about distance, but it's also a recognition and it it feels like home when you recognize something, it feels like home. Even if we don't always know that that's the feeling, that's one of the feelings that sentimentality and connection uh, creates. I think when, uh, especially with the tomato pin cushions, anyone who has sewed. Yes, my mother had them in that. Yes. Yes. As a little girl, because my mother did sew a lot. She made dresses for me. She made her own clothes. It used to be something you could do. You would save a huge amount of money making your own clothes. Mm -hmm. Today, it's the opposite, I think. Yes, it is the opposite. But I remember as a girl, her button collection was in a tin, like a metal tin. I could take the lid off and I love the feeling of putting my hands in them. Mm. She had a lot of interesting buttons. My father had been in the Merchant Marine. He was a ship's captain and he brought her buttons from China that were porcelain. He would bring her bolts of fabric to make things out of anyway. But we lived in San Francisco then. I remember that time so well because We lived in an old Victorian flat that was upstairs and San Francisco is, or at least then it was in the fifties was a period piece. Yeah. Everything had been built probably after the earthquake in 1906. So Mm -hmm. it had that look that just got burned into my brain. That's I think what's beautiful. These, these connections, right? We go back to this issue of, of sentimentality, of recognition. And and I think that your work is very broad. You have different things that you do. You've 
you know, even though there are certain similarities, you've gone through different stages, but there's this sense of recognition that I think people relate to. I think that's one of the reasons why it's so many people are becoming even more interested than they were before. There's always been interest in your work, but there's even more now. You are going to have an exhibition in Lisbon and you are in several museums. Can you tell us about your upcoming exhibition in Lisbon? Yes, I'm so excited because I'm going to be going there. It's a small gallery in Lisbon, Portugal, and the gallery owner, his name is Daniel Lamb. It's ADZ Gallery, so it's those letters, ADZ Gallery. The way he described the space, he said it's uh, four smaller rooms with very tall ceilings in the historic part of Lisbon, right near the waterfront, all of that. Uh, He responded to my work because he talked about the slowness of, let's see if I can describe it. It's not his exact words, but it was something about when he looked at my work, you can see the time I put into it. And maybe the work would slow you down to have to look at it or the slowness. And he moved to Lisbon mainly because he's from England, but he was driving through Lisbon and was so struck by the beauty of the country, the way people just kind of live their life in kind of a different way. It's not a rat race. It's Anyway, I'm excited about that, and I'll have work there. Some of it is older work, some of it's newer, but it really, it it, it has a very common thread running through it, so. That's very work, exciting. It's not like there's a glaring difference between the older work and the newer work. Anyway, but so it's in February, the reception will be February 15th, and I love to travel. So so if there's anybody in Europe listening to this podcast, be sure that you go to this exhibition in Lisbon because it's going to be great. And Nancy, if I can just play a little bit more with what you mentioned, this idea of slowness, which I will call detail and care because it does require a certain amount of attention to details and care to do things in a certain manner. It's not a copy of a copy, right? It's not a Cindy Sherman piece. That's not to say there isn't value in Cindy Sherman. There is, but it's not that. It's something that it is high art, but it's also craft. There's a lot of craft involved, yes. which is also something that women used to do. In- yes. Also very important to me that it be craft because in the early seventies, it was looked down on the same way women were looked down on as artists or just as women to elevate the idea of craft to fine art is I think something the women's movement has done, especially mm. for the feminist art movement. Definitely. It's something really provocative when you're able to say, yes, that's art. Yes, that requires a lot of work. Yes. There's something really quite special when you can look at the craft. I love visiting an uncle of mine and his wife, who is an incredible artist. She likes to paint and she does fine painting. Uh, She'll like to play around with a different palette for an X amount of time until she tries a different color palette. And so then you'll see different artworks with different palettes, or then you'll see that she sews things or, you know, they, they bought a pool table. So she hand sewed the covering for the pool table and put old fashioned tassels. The amount of work that went into the craft of sewing the cover for their pool table with these tassels. And she did the same thing for their curtains. Oh, wow. just as much work as when I saw her engaging in fine art. And sometimes there's a little 
snootiness or snobbiness with art and what we call high art, low art, middle art. And yes, art should be accessible. Yes, you do need training. Yes, it's useful, you know, to take lessons and to learn, but you cannot discount the effort and the skill of someone who might be doing something that's quote unquote crafty versus something that you may consider a highbrow sculptor or painting. They're different things, but they all have value. Yeah. And it's important for us to remember that. And I do think that's what's really quite fascinating about your artwork, Nancy, is that you see the craft, but you also see the the art. I mean, you, you went to school, obviously you have an MFA and you were able to bridge those worlds of bringing the craft with the quote unquote critical thought, the concept and the quote unquote highbrow technique. And you've integrated them both and brought light into the fact that we're very colorful people, meaning we're, we're many things. And so is art. Thank you. That was a great description. Nancy, it's just been an absolute joy, but I would like to ask you two more questions. Okay. One is a very easy one, which is if people want to know more about your work, where would they go? Probably to my website, which is my name, N-A-N-C-Y-Y-O-U-D-E-L-M-A-N.com. If it's spelled correctly, or a Google search is actually good too, because I've done, I've done interviews and given talks that have been recorded. And you know, I wanted to mention again the show in Portugal, as it it's at ADZ Gallery in Lisbon, Portugal. So you could uh, look up, people could look up that gallery. Yes, and. My final question to you is, Nancy, for working artists and rising artists, is there any sage advice that you can give as someone who's had a career that's over 50 years long? Oh, okay. You know, I've I've thought about this recently because I was thought about, because someone asked me, you said, you still work you know, a lot and sometimes every day. And, and why is that? One thing I was told early on is you need a space to work. That's not a kitchen table. The way Judy put it was a dedicated space, a studio that was always important to her. And I found for me, same thing right now, this building this is a separate building I had built almost 20 years ago. It was, oh, it was exactly 20 years ago because it was started September 2003. So it's a separate space that's only my studio. It's for work. It's for me. I would say, you know, and, and if a young artist could start out maybe in a spare room or a garage, but just if it's a dedicated space to work. And another thing I was told, this was by Inez Storer, an older artist. She said to do a little bit every day. She said, always keep an oar in the water as the way she described it. She said, even if you in your studio, you just straighten up a table. That's for me, that's when I get ideas. When I go out, you know, I start moving things around and then I find something as, oh, yes, <laughs> you know, and I start working with that. Another thing is to look at art, go to big cities, go to museums, kind of immerse yourself in art and, and traveling. Traveling is important, all of that. But I think mostly having a space to work and to realize that whatever ideas you have are important, regardless of what someone else might say, you know, hopefully you starting out, you get some positive reinforcement, but that doesn't always, I hope I covered enough of that because that's important. I love 
meeting with younger artists and finding out what they're doing and how they work and it's something that's been very valuable to me, especially lately. Nancy, thank you so much for the privilege of having you on Presence and listening to you and your wisdom and your story. It's amazing and beautiful. And thank you for all of the work that you do and for joining us today. Well, thank you, because to me, it's an honor to be able to talk about this. So I really appreciate that you asked me to do Uh, it. Absolute joy. Please be sure to Google Nancy or go to her website, go to the exhibit. If you are in Europe, if you are in the Los Angeles area, you can go to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Her work is also at the San Francisco Museum, at the Brooklyn Museum, and a few others. So there's different ways that you can engage with Nancy's work and see it. Thank you very much. And we will see you next week on Presence. Thank you for joining us on Presence. For more information on how you can create greater levels of impactful presence in your professional and personal life, visit www.cindyurrutia.com and follow me on social media. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. Feel free to post a comment and we'll read it on the show.